Hello and welcome to this uh, video in which I'm going to present some information about the roots, lineage and historical development of the Enneagram. And this is the first of two that I will do. Um, and this is to provide some background for another course that I'm doing online uh, which you can register for and you can get information from the video later on when I will show you the website link. Um, but the Enneagram is a mythological symbol that represents deep mysteries and it comes from ancient wisdom but it also has roots as we shall see uh, in an ancient story a myth which is about making the epic journey into the deeper shadows of our personality aspects of us that are hidden from our consciousness but that, are, that affect the way that we respond to life and behave now the modern Enneagram is a synthesis and amalgam of several wisdom traditions that go back to the dawn of civilization it's an ancient way of seeing reality and of understanding ourselves as human beings that's re-emerged in the modern world and incorporated some of the things that we have um, we've learned from science and psychology especially from Jungian psychology but there, there are two things that we need to distinguish when we're looking at the origins of the Enneagram there's the symbol and the typology The Enneagram was originally a symbol representing three fundamental cosmological laws which, if properly understood and applied, helps in the process of transforming anything from a societal, social structure or a project to human beings as individuals so that they can reach their full potential. The symbol consists of three elements, a circle representing the law of one, a triangle representing the law of three, and the hexad of criss crisscrossing lines representing the law of seven. The law of one is the law of sacred unity and diversity. The law of three, which Gurdjieff called the law of world creation, is about how three independent forces are needed for anything new to come into being. That law is also about the Trinitarian structure of sacred unity. And the law of seven, which is based on the mathematics of a musical scale, is about the process of alchemical transformation of substances. Now I'll be going into what these laws are all about and how understanding them helps us in my forthcoming for Fourth Way Enneagram course. So this is what Gurdjieff had to say about it. The Enneagram is a schematic diagram of perpetual motion. But of course it is necessary to know how to read this diagram. The understanding of this symbol and the ability to make use of it give human beings very great power. It is the philosopher's stone of the alchemists. Now the Enneagram as understood and taught by Gurdjieff, that who the person who introduced this ancient symbol to the modern world, has subsequently been called the process Enneagram to distinguish it from the modern Enneagram of personality. Then there is the modern Enneagram of personality which is the popular version um, and which is more focused on people discovering what type of personality they, they have and how to grow into a more rounded and whole human being. Now there are problems with limiting the Enneagram to this more modern approach in that it does not cohere with the original meaning of the, the Enneagram, although there have been some who I think have unsuccessfully tried, tried unsuccessfully to do so. However, there's no doubt in my mind that this modern approach to the Enneagram that has incorporated the insights from psychology is valid and has been tested and tried by many to their benefit. And as I shall point out, it also has ancient roots. So in this first video, I'll deal with the origins of the symbol and then subsequently show how the modern personality Enneagram that's in my next video incorporated other ancient streams of wisdom and philosophy into the symbol to create the personality Enneagram. The approach to the Enneagram that I'm adopting in my fourth way Enneagram course is unlike most that you will come across in books you read or courses that you might attend that start with the personality typing. 
Now I understand why they do so, because people do want to understand themselves better, but as I pointed out in the blurb on the website about this course, the purpose of the Enneagram, both as originally taught by Gurdjieff and the Enneagram of Personality, is not, not to put people in boxes or label people as personality types, but to enable people to reconnect with the essence of who, who they really are and be released from being dominated by their ego personality. George Ivanovich Gurdjieff began to teach about the Enneagram to a group of his students in St. Petersburg in 1915. He also was teaching in Moscow at the same time, I think. He travelled between the two. He had recently arrived there, having spent many years searching for, the, for truth and meaning in the Middle East. He was a bit disillusioned by um, the Eastern Orthodox faith in, in which he was brought up. I will be talking more about Gurdjieff much later. He claimed to have discovered some of what he taught in esoteric Christian circles. However, one of Gurdjieff's students, J.G. Bennett, I think it's John Bennett, who after Gurdjieff's de death researched his sources, records that um, he discovered the Enneagram in a Sufi monastery in Afghanistan from whom he had learned its esoteric meaning and how to work with it. As I say, I'll say more about Gurdjieff later. Bennett also says that this cosmic secret of perpetual self-renewal, as Gurdjieff called it, was discovered more than 4,000 years ago in Mesopotamia by a brotherhood of wise men who then passed it down from generation to generation. But it may also have had connections to ancient Egyptian cosmology. Cosmology. Um, for the ancient Egyptians, the number nine was the number of completeness. It was three times three. three. And so what, you, what you'll see over and over again in ancient Egyptian cosmology and social structures are systems of nine. And any complete teaching had nine elements to it, nine qualities, nine combinations. In ancient Egyptian mythology, the full complement of nine gods constituted the whole teaching. Now, Egypt called, Egyptologists called these systems enneads from any other Greek for nine. And interestingly, Porphyry, a student of Plotinus, the third century philosopher who is reputed to be the father of Neoplatonism, catalogued his mentor's teachings in groups of nine, which he called enneads. Hence, Enneagram is a figure of nine. Our system of numbering originated in ancient India. They believed that numbers are archetypes and have meanings that can be discerned. And the way that they did this was through looking at the digital root of a number. The Enneagram is a symbolic representation of this ancient way of understanding our, the universe and ourselves through numerology. The study, which is the study of a mystical relationship between numbers and the character or action of physical objects and living things. The digital root is found by adding up each digit in a, in a number. So, for example, the digital root of 12 is 1 plus 2, which is 3. The digital root of 34 is 3 plus 4, which is 7. And if the sum of the numbers is more than 9, you add the digits of the sum until you arrive at a number that is between 1 and 9. So, the number 528, the significance of which I will come to later, has a digital root of 5 plus 2 plus 8, which is 15, and add one to five, adding 1 to 5 gives the digital root 6. The digital root of all numbers, no matter how high you go, always ends up being a number between 1 and 9. So now you can see how this feeds into the Enneagram. And the ancient Hindus thought this patterning was fascinating. Now, these ideas were picked up and developed mathematically by Pythagoras of Samos, some 500 years before the Christian era. He was an astrologer, musician, mathematician, numerologist and mystic. And I believe he, or probably the Pythagoreans, his followers, are represented by the Magi in the Gospel of Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus. 
Now Pythagoras and his followers believe that the universe and its contents, including music, are structured by beautiful mathematics and equations, and the fact that they are at all structured by the extraordinary abstract and idealistic language of numbers is evidence, they believed, for the intelligent origin, origins of the universe. And in this school of thinking, a crucial role is played by numbers 1 to 9, with the number 10 characterizing the cosmos as a whole. So Pythagoreans also believe that numbers could be used to elicit mystical truths, including the cosmological laws that I've been mentioning in the symbol of the Enneagram, and as a basis for contemplation because the numbers are an archetypical kind of language that links us to the divine mind. You just have to know how to read them. So I'll be returning to the mystical meanings of the digital roots and how they relate to the Enneagram later when I talk about the significance of the Fibonacci sequence. Already you can see that there are probably many streams feeding into the Enneagram as represented in this diagram here. Now Sufism, as most of you will know, is the mystical stream of Islam and since Gurdjieff learned about the Enneagram from a Sufi group, group it might be important to note here that some trace the pre-Islamic roots of Sufism back through the early Christian mystics of Syria and Egypt to the Essenes and ancient Pythagorean orders and to the mystery schools of the Egyptians and Zoroastrians. Now the Essenes were a movement in, within Judaism that sought to preserve the early first temple Ju Judaism which is a faith that believed in the Trinity that balanced the masculine and feminine aspects of God. So there was God Most High, El Elyon, there was Yahweh, God in masculine form, and El Shaddai, literally meaning the God with breasts, God in female form, also known as Asherah. And Asherah um, was worshipped, and they were worshipped very much in what they call high places. Now, uh, scattered around, so it was not a, it was a decentralized faith, if you like. Um, although there was the first temple, I think, was built by Solomon after David, David's, so anyway, this faith was crushed in 621 BCE by King Josiah and the Deuteronomists, that were a priestly school that wanted to enforce a more rigid masculine and nationalistic version of the faith. However, First Temple Judaism was kept alive by certain Jewish groups in exile, both in Babylon and in Egypt, and there's evidence for that and eventually by the Essenes. The Essenes were one of these groups uh, um, within, um, within Ju Judea, well, within ancient Israel. So you can see how all of these streams were feeding into each other. Now, Margaret Barker, a theologian and biblical scholar who's examined the apocryphal texts and documents of the Essene community, shown depicted here, the Qumran community, the ruins of it uh, near the Dead Sea, and they uh, and and these obviously are known as the De Dead Sea Scrolls. They were found in 1946 and 47, and in also I think more in 1956. She believes that Jesus himself was probably grew up in an Essene community to which his parents, and Joseph, as well as Mary Magdalene, his beloved companion, belonged. Now Alexander the Great conquered Egypt and founded the city of Alexandria. The Greeks recognized there was a gold mine of knowledge concerning the nature of humanity and the nature of the universe in the cultures of the peoples they had conquered. So they did their best to preserve some of that. His successors that's, and uh, Alexander the Great's success, successors, Ptolemy the first and second, developed the great library that he had founded there. And it, it was there in Alexandria that Christianity started to take root in Egypt. Almost all of the first theologians that established the metaphysical framework of the Christian faith were trained in Alexandria. Among them, Oregon, Bishop of Alexandria around about 185 to 253 Christian era, was one of them. So among he, both he and Plotinus, the philosopher who is associated with a revival of and uh, an updating of Plato's philosophy, Neoplatonism that is, were trained by a little-known teacher in the University of Alexandria 
called Ammonia Saccus. And I'll say, say something about a Plati how Plotinus influenced the development of the modern Enneagram later. Now, Oregon, influenced by what he came across in his library, began to apply numerology to sacred writings as a way of interpreting their inner meaning. But there's more than merely the intellectual pursuit of knowledge going on in Egypt. The ancients integrated intellectual ways of knowing with a more direct way of knowing. Gnosis. This is about experiential and participatory knowledge. What is clear is that in the ancient world people could and did, through practice, have experiences of dissolving into union with the ultimate divine one. All the names for God in the ancient Middle Eastern languages are Allah, Allah, that's the Aramaic, and El in, in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew uh, mean the one. And this is what mystics desire above all else. To, they long to have a sense of communion with the divine. Now Plotinus called it henosis, a term to which we again we will return later. So it's not surprising that besides being the home of the early Christian theological development, Egypt also became the also became the home of the early Christian mystics. So people went into the desert to meditate, contemplate and pray to seek that experiential knowledge. And this is where the desert fathers and mothers set up their monasteries. So one of these was Evagrius Ponticus. Um, his teachers, teachings were actually much later integrated into the modern Enneagram. Um, and he was a 14th century mystic and academic. Uh, Evagrius uh, lived uh, between 345 and 399, Christian era, somewhere around about then. Um, following a disastrous affair with a married woman, Evagrius left a promising ecclesiastical career in Constantinople and travelled to Jerusalem, where in 383 she, he became a monk and then went to Egypt and spent the remaining years of his life in one of the monasteries there. Now, Evagris used the numerology of Pythagoras to interpret scripture like Oregon had. For example, he used Pythagoras' principles of sacred geometry to interpret the symbolic meaning of the number 153, which was the number of fish caught by the disciples in the closing scene of John's Gospel, uh, is the 21st chapter. I, I mean, what's the digital root of 153? 1 plus 5 plus 3, yeah, that's right, it's 9. So, significant. Some elements of these are seen in the Enneagram symbol. So I won't elaborate on this here, but you will find it in Richard Raw and Andreas Herbert's book, The Enneagram, A Christian Perspective, their first chapter. But Evagrius was also a keen observer of what today we would call human psychology, observing both in himself and in his disciples the ways in which people lose a sense of the divine presence, that is always and only experienced in the present moment. He and other Desert Fathers developed the idea of passions because they were, these were emotional energies that arose out of a certain distinct kind of suffering. And the names he gave these, indolence, lust, gluttony, fear, avarice, envy, pride and anger or resentment correspond to what is known today as the passions of the Enneagram personalities about which I will say more in a later session. And eventually these were whittled down by Pope Gregory the Great in the 6th century to what became known as the Seven Deadly Sins. Uh, he omitted fear and anger or resentment. But by then the whole concept of sin had been tainted by this idea of original sin that St. Augustine in introduced. Originally humans were not seen as inherently sinful. And salvation was not about being rescued from eternal torment in hell. Sin was falling short of the ideal, missing the mark for sure, which is what the words mean in the ancient languages, but it wasn't seen as a moral failing. And the passions were understood as ways by which we lose touch with the sacred unity that is our birthright. And the, the original idea was that by being aware of your sin, or being aware of your tendency to leave presence through your passion, you open the way for God's grace to come in and help 
and work and work with you. But Evagrius never integrated his understanding of the dynamics of human personality and psychology, which he expressed in the language of his day as demons, with his understanding of the Enneagram symbol. So, so though we don't know how all of these ideas were communicated across the religious divides, there seems to be in a common development of ideas amongst all the mystical three schools of the three Abrahamic faiths, Kabbalah in Judaism, Sufism in Islam, and various streams of mystical Christianity. The patterning of digital roots and their relationship to sacred geometry can be found in the Fibonacci sequence as well. The next number in the Fibonacci sequence is the sum of the previous two, so you get 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, etc. As illustrated here, and conventional wisdom suggests that the Fibonacci numbers were introduced in 1202 by Leonardo of Pisa, um, better known today as Fibonacci, in his book Liber Abaci, which was the most influential text on mathematics produced in Europe at that time. However, Fibonacci had spent time in North Africa, where Islamic scholarship flourished, so historians have reason to surmise that he had learned it from Muslim scholars, but this fact was probably edited out by the Christian Church. In fact, it is most likely it goes all the way back to Pythagoras who, as I said, viewed mathematics as a mystical science. If you take the first 12 numbers of the Fibonacci sequence, as in the left-hand column of columns of this slide, and then the next 12 numbers as in the right-hand columns of this slide, you'll, and you calculate the digital roots for both, and then you add the digital roots of the first 12 numbers to the digital roots of, roots of the next, and you get the digital root of 9. This is the mathematics of perfection, and 9 represents and is the symbol of perfection. And because the digital root of 12 is 3 and the digital root of 24 is 6, so we have the 3, 6 and 9 linked in the Enneagram by the inner triangle playing out in the Fibonacci sequence as well, at least in the digital roots of it. The Fibonacci sequence matters to architecture and nature and many other things because it is felt to be the key basis of visual harmony. Every number divided by the previous number in the series gives a ratio that is extremely close to the golden ratio of 1 to 6. Indeed, the higher up you go, the closer you get to the golden ratio. Now you see this ratio in the natural world, like in the whirls of a sunflower, and in architecture, such as in Chartres Cathedral. Now, Gordon Strachan, whom I knew personally and who has since died, wrote a book entitled Chartres Cathedral, Sacred Geometry, Sacred Space. And some years before he died, I was having a meal with him and his wife when he started to tell me about some of the things he had uncovered in his research. He said that he believed that Chartres has connections with the Enneagram through the Knights Templar, who learned, it about it from the, learned about it from the Sufis, with whom he had had a very good relationship in Jerusalem. Indeed, it was Sufi masons who helped in its design, so I'm quoting from his book. The most important clue that the Templars' mission was not only to guard the pilgrim routes, but to learn from the Sufis, lies in the symbolism of the number nine. When the order was founded in 1118, there were only nine knights, which is strange because it is obvious that nine were far too few to be effective as protectors of pilgrims. Even more odd is the fact that no more knights were added for a further nine years. What is overlooked is that they were already undergoing a profoundly spiritual and personal experience, and this derived from their encounters with the Sufis and other Islamic scholars whose knowledge included the higher spiritual dimensions of Gnosis. And Gordon goes on to explain that this Gnosis was also taught them through the Enneagram, and it's also significant that in the original design there were to be nine towers around the cathedral. Around the same 
period of time, we find features of the Enneagram symbol in the work of Ramon Lull, uh, 1236 to 1315. He was a Majorcan who became a Franciscan. Um, uh, I think it was a tertiary lay order after a dramatic conversion experience. He was also an alchemist, one of the mystical streams of Christianity. And he studied Hebrew and Arabic and set up language schools mainly to facilitate the conversation between Christians, Jews and Muslims, who during the era, era of Moorish rule had made an impact on that island. And from the 9th until the 12th centuries, during the time when Spain was ruled by the Moors, all three faiths were learning from each other. And Ramon Lull used the absolute and relative qualities of God as a starting point for these conversations, but the the fact that he depicted these in a diagram that is very like the Enneagram symbol is evidence that he may have picked this up from Sufis and possibly from Jewish Kabbalah as well. Well that brings me to the end of the first video which has all been focused on the origins of the symbol of the Enneagram. Um, of course all I have done is to try and point to various strands of evidence um, to show that there are lots of ideas being um, being woven together. We have no concrete proof in terms of an ancient artifact that proves that the Enneagram symbol itself was something that um, came from ancient times like this. Um, however, uh, Pythagoras was certainly the one that, because of his interest in ma the sacred mathematics, which he, in he included his, his geometrical workings and some of the drawings that he came up with that uh, have hints of the Enneagram and the Enneagram symbol in it. But I hope that this has been helpful and uh, I'm going to be talking in my next video about the um, well, the roots of the modern Enneagram of personality and how it developed.